Jacob read the room quickly and decisively and noticed the change of atmospherics when he interacted with Laban. At this time, God spoke directly to Jacob. Time to return to the land of promise. We get some of the backstory of the last six years in this mention of 10 changes in Laban's salary incentive scheme. God had transferred a large portion of the increases in Laban's flock over to Jacob. Jacob has the complete backing of his wives, who are greatly aggrieved at their father's treatment of them. Laban's self-centered behavior has resulted in the loss of respect of his daughter. Laban is a classic, unloving, money-grubbing narcissist. Jacob waited for the time of shearing, an opportune distraction. Laban's extended absence opened a window of escape. Jacob was effectively a prisoner to Laban's tyranny. Unbeknown to Jacob, Rachel steals the household idols. The terrifying. Laban is breathing fire. You want to know how angry Laban was? He was so angry, he travelled over 60 kilometres per day for seven days straight. So Laban can officially be counted among the Gentile prophets of God. The most infamous of the Gentile prophets of God was Balaam. Both men were Gentile prophets of God. Both were from Padan Aram, both greedy for selfish advancement, both willing to travel long distances to secure their wealth. Both were warned by God to limit their speech against the family of Jacob. So here we have Laban, murder in his eyes, chest puffed out, his men menacingly gathered, boasting of his power to harm. Laban's bark is worse than his bite. In the end, he ends up looking very weak. Why did you steal my teraphim? Everyone knew Jacob had justifiable reason for doing what he did. I think Laban's zeal and rage diminished as he searched each tent, becoming less certain as he came up empty in each tent. Boy, am I going to look silly if I don't find these teraphim? Jacob now sees the deflation of Laban, his rage-filled eyes now showing defeat. So Jacob goes on the attack. Jacob unloads. 20 years of stored up injustice were Laban's dishonest dealings. Jacob had publicly and comprehensively exposed the unrighteousness of Laban, and everyone knew it, including Laban. You almost feel sorry for Laban at this point. He's like a deflated party balloon. He's been exposed for the crook he is in front of everyone. These are my daughters, and my grandchildren, and my flocks. Jacob has no need to reply back to Laban. After the contract in blood was signed by both men, Jacob and his sons gather stone, setting it up as a pillar, a remembrance of his day. In effect, Jacob is promising to care for Laban's daughters, knowing that Laban would never see them again. This heap became the marker point of separation between Laban and Jacob. This is actually a very sad covenant, confirming a permanent parting of ways. They eat, sleep the night, and early in the morning, sad old Laban rises, kisses his daughters and grandchildren, blesses them, departs, and never sees any of them ever again. 